For over a century, Disney has felt like a magical, wonder-filled universe. Since its inception, Disney has inspired billions of kids from all around the world. Its theme parks seem like magical universes, where everything is perfect. But maybe Disney seems just a little too perfect. All this squeaky clean TV shows, movies, Disney parks, music, its founding origins, it all appears just so flawless on the outside. But on the inside, Disney is home to some of the most haunting things imaginable. From literal beheadings, slave-like sweatshops, to pedophilia and even sex trafficking, there's a side to Disney that has been covered up for decades and decades as they make sure their image continues to be squeaky clean, no matter the consequences. Even going so far as to sue a grieving father for putting Spider-Man on his four-year-old's grave, Disney is doing everything in its power to ensure it retains its perfect image. But it's time we expose the other side of the magic, the side of Disney they don't want you to know. Where we will go into every horrifying secret about Disney, and where better to start than the disturbing world of Disney theme parks. Disney parks are renowned for their over the top roller coasters and 99% of the time they're just perfect. After all Disney wants to protect its image and so they take almost every precaution to keep the parks as safe as possible. But Disney parks, supposedly the happiest place on earth, do have some very tragic stories to tell. You see, Disneyland opened up on July 18th, 1955, and quickly built some of its most iconic roller coasters. The Matterhorn Bobstep was the first tubular steel continuous track roller coaster in the world. The ride was modeled after the famous Swiss Alps, and riders would be thrown around dark caves, sharp turns, and the infamous growls of the abdominal snowman. However, despite its fame and popularity, the Matterhorn Bobstabs have a somewhat darker side to their history, primarily due to safety concerns and tragic accidents. The ride seemed safe for the most part, but back then certain precautions weren't taken as seriously. So on July 3rd, 1959, Gary Duback, a 24-year-old mechanist, was performing a routine check on the Matterhorn bobsleds, and his task was to inspect the running gears of the bobsleds, an essential maintenance job to ensure the safety and smooth operation of the ride. However, the task took a very weird turn. While Dubak was working on the ride, a bobsled filled with passengers came barreling down the track. Dubak hadn't realized what was coming, and the bobsled rode straight into him. The impact was severe and immediate. Dubak was struck by the bobsled, and the force of the collision knocked him off the mountain structure off the ride. He plummeted approximately 100 feet to the ground, a fall that would have been fatal for many. Miraculously, Dubak somehow survived this, but not without serious injuries. He suffered extensive damage to his arms, legs and back, along with various bruises covering his body. He was then swiftly sent to Santa Ana Community Hospital, where he would undergo significant medical procedure, the removal of a bone to relieve the pressure caused by his injuries. And although unlikely, Dubak actually survived this as well. He was monitored in the ICU for several weeks, and his injuries meant he was paralyzed below the waist. His case is horrifying, and with such a major injury, you'd expect every safety precaution to be in place. But perhaps over time, the staff let their guard down, because fast forward nine years, and the same ride would be the first to take a life at Disney. This was Mark Maples, having the time of his life. Maples made his way to the iconic Matterhorn bobsleds after a few other rides. The 15 year old hopped on the somewhat thrilling roller coaster, but things didn't go as he hoped, as his belt had actually been unbuckled by one of his companions. Like a typical 15 year old boy taking his chances, Maples tried to stand up as the bobsled neared the park of the mountain, but he would lose his balance and was thrown from the bobsled to the track below. As a result, he suffered massive injuries, a fractured skull, broken ribs, and internal injuries that would eventually take his life three days later from the fall. Disneyland didn't take this lightly. They'd only been open a few years and had a reputation to protect. If anything, this catapulted a cover plan for all future incidents. But tragically, a couple years later in 1968, the same Matterhorn bobsleds found another victim. Dolly Young is a 48-year-old from Vermont, California. And in January 1984, Dolly also visited Disneyland with a group of friends and colleagues from Avon. It was meant to be a fun-filled break. Disneyland, for its iconic statues and thrills, was the perfect place to go. Their day at the Park was going just fine, filled with laughter, screams, and roller coasters. That wasn't until they decided to ride the haunted Matterhorn bobsleds. Now, the ride had gone through various changes over the years since Mark Maple's death, but there was still this taboo about the ride. The whispers of Mark's young death had become more of a legend to make the ride more thrilling to those who knew about it, but this time it was more terrifying than anybody would expect. Dolly sat in the back carriage by herself, but unexpectedly, something went horribly wrong during the ride. As the ride progressed, Dolly was thrown out of the bobsled car without any warning. This moment was actually witnessed by passengers in the Skyway gondola, who had no choice but to watch Dolly's body lay on the tracks, disorientated and injured. If the original impact didn't kill her, then the next moment would take an even worse turn, as another 
corpse they came hurtling down the track and collided with her body. The fatal impact also caused Dolly to lose her head, as she became literally decapitated. Her body was trapped between the bobstay car wheels and the track, which had Dolly's head in the correct height and position to cause the decapitation. The father of two in the oncoming sled had to hold his daughters to close their eyes, which was their saving grace as it was said that that scene was extremely gruesome and you can only imagine how horrible this would be. The scene was so horrifying that even the first responders and park staff needed therapy to deal with what they had seen. Investigations later claimed that Dolly had either not had her safety belt secured or had taken it off temporarily. However, others questioned whether it was the belt that malfunctioned altogether. Dolly's family, devastated by this loss, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Disney, claiming negligence. The case dragged on for several years and was eventually settled out of court in 1988. These were only two dates that took place on the iconic roller coaster, but by taking into account the traffic Disney sees daily, it almost feels like it's bound to happen. In fact, reported deaths from Disneyland generally span years apart from each other which seems less than likely. That's because when you dig into Disney's history, you'll find it's filled with missing pieces. This is the result of the unique way in which Disney gets to run itself. When Disney built its theme parks in Florida, Walt Disney wants to complete control over the environment surrounding the park. He realized that the previous park brought in external businesses that had sprung up around Disneyland, affecting its immersive experience. And so Disney strategically purchased land in Florida through various shell companies to keep the project under wraps and avoid any price hikes. The acquisition also included negotiating mineral rights, ensuring no on interference in the development of Disney World. The next step was to get the local state government on its side. They even created their own special district within Florida that still remains today, where they control everything from building codes and waste management to emergency services. Although they still adhere to federal safety and environmental regulations, Disney's control over this district means they can operate with a level of autonomy that has never been seen with any typical corporate or theme park setting. It's like they have their own personal town, and the company brings in so much money to the district that they can threaten to pull out of the location should the state not bow to their needs. This keeps happening right now in Florida today. With Disney threatening Ron DeSantis that if Florida gets rid of woke education, Disney threatens to leave. But this is a whole other topic that I discuss on my main channel, Moon. And so of course, they have their own medical team and their own tax there. And what that means is that Disney gets to control the narrative of their theme park. And so when tragedies take place or something Disney doesn't want the world to know happens within the park grounds, they can prevent it all from reaching public media in a bad way. The object would be to remove the dark cloud of death by any means to protect their name and reputation. And so anytime these people die on these roller coasters or have their heads chopped off, Disney can blame pre-existing medical conditions. They can blame other external factors or just have people removed from their property entirely before being pronounced dead. Therefore, the death was not technically on their property, and Disney would avoid all negative publicity that came with this death. It's a protocol they take across all their parks. Despite this, sometimes they can't control the situation as much as they'd like, which is why there are still some instances where Disney has no choice in the matter but to take ownership of the death on their premises. True crime stories give us a peek into the mind of a criminal, but how do we figure out the truth when the main perpetrators are an ex-presidential candidate and a company Fortune considers to be one of the most admired by the world? Disney has been feuding with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis since 2022, after the company criticized a state law that restricted classroom lessons on gender identity and sexual orientation. This led to the creation of a new governing body overseeing Riddy Creek. I came across this article detailing the audit conducted by the DeSantis appointed board and used ground news to find more coverage on the former Disney controlled Reedy Creek board allegedly committing corporate cronyism and bribery. They found over 30 articles including the audit itself, all categorized by the source's political leaning with tabs highlighting its reliability and ownership. While this article quotes Disney dismissing the assessment as unreliable and an attack on free speech, this one highlights discrepancies between Disney's promises of community development and their actual actions. So I'm glad ground news link the assessment so I could read it myself. Now, if you don't already know, today's sponsor Ground News does a really great job of making current events easier to understand. Their app and website gathers related news articles from around the world on any topic, adding context that highlights any potential bias that might affect its reporting. I especially love that they include the primary source in their story overviews because getting the facts right is the only way to fully understand current events without getting lost in conflicting perspectives, something I think Ground News makes a lot easier. So go to ground.news slash mooncrime to check it out. Plans start under $1 a month, but my link gets you 40% off their unlimited access vantage plan. 
An example is the case of Deborah Gale Stone, an 18 year old who was known as an outgoing friendly girl. She was the perfect friendly face that Disney would look for in an employee. On July 8th, 1974, while working on the stage of the American Sings attraction, Deborah had the job to greet the audience and make them feel welcome to the 24 minute show, and then bid them farewell at the end. A fairly simple job and one that suited Deborah well. This specific attraction had at the time only been opened nine days prior and was designed as a tribute to the rich tapestry of American music. The show featured a large cast of audio and animatronic animals that sang and performed various songs from American history. The America Sing stage was completely automated and had six different stages. The stage would rotate for each scene to take place and create a visually telling story. And on this particular night, Deborah was extremely excited because she had just been proposed to. In fact, she had just called her parents to ask for permission to marry the person she was so deeply in love with. Due to some failed security precautions and a lack of enough training and perhaps too much excitement clouding Deborah's headspace, she had been in the wrong spot at the wrong time. As during a change between two shows, Deborah was caught between the revolving stage door and a still platform during a 45 second interval. A visitor called Daniel Robson was sitting with his family in the front row of an adjoining theatre and he witnessed what he thought was quote, a child being pulled between the platform and wall and heard a scream. He quickly ran to notify the operators. The poor girl was crushed to a pulp by the revolving wheels. It was described that she was smashed to bits. Disney's reaction was not very apologetic because the attraction was only closed off for a mere two days while they cleaned up and installed warning lights. Eventually, Disney did renovate and build walls to prevent such instances from ever being possible, but it was little too late for Deborah. Her life was tragically stolen from her in the most gruesome way possible. But you may be wondering, what about more recent times? Well, with Disney's tight grip on what's actually taken place within Disneyland or Disney World, as well as their control of the media, and of course their greater technology and more safety precautions, fewer cases have been reported than ever. Of course, seasonally, the park's visit numbers increase and where there are more people, more accidents are likely. On Christmas Eve 1998, Luan Fidorsen, a 34-year-old senior computer programmer at Microsoft, along with his wife and their family, would visit Disneyland in California. And as you might have guessed, this was to celebrate the festive season. However, this would all turn into a nightmare in the blink of an eye. This case would take place at the sailing ship Columbia, which is a full-scale replica of the first American ship to circumnavigate the globe. The ship offers guests a leisurely voyage around the rivers of America, and during the ride, passengers can enjoy historical details and nautical themed music, enhancing the experience of an 18th century sailing ship. And to make things worse, the saddening moment took place on the sailing ship Columbia, a relatively tame ride that's really not scary at all. And Luan and his wife and family were on the dock waiting in line to board the next ride. Christine Carpenter, an assistant manager acting as a substitute ride operator at the time, was not trained enough to work on this particular ride. And so when trying to halt the ship by tying a mooring line to a metal cleat on the dock, the cleat ripped off because the ship was still traveling too fast. And as the cleat ripped off, it launched into the air and went straight towards the family. Luan was directly hit in the head and then onto his wife's face too. And after being struck by the metal cleat, he was critically injured and transported to a hospital. There he was put on life support due to the severity of his injuries. And sadly, a few days after the accident, Luan was taken off life support and then pronounced dead on December 28, 1998. His wife was lucky enough to live with the brute force taken to her face, but she was partially paralyzed. And this whole thing led to a huge widespread investigation. And it was found that the cleat, which should have been used only for securing the ship after docking, might have been repeatedly misused. Furthermore, doubts were raised about whether Carpenter had actually received adequate training for her role. And so of course, Disney faced huge criticism for cleaning the accident site before the arrival of investigators, though it was claimed this was done to minimize shock to other guests. The entire aftermath saw significant legal and safety repercussions. The Dawsons filed a wrongful death lawsuit, highlighting issues such as the use of nylon rope instead of a hemp rope for docking. Also alleging that Disney had been aware of the rope's issues but did not replace it. Inadequate training and lack of communication amongst the staff were also cited as contributing factors. Eventually, this led to a settlement estimated between 20 to 25 $5 million dollars and prompted Disneyland to implement various safety measures and operational changes, including revising docking procedures for the Columbia, the adoption of bell signals, and the reintroduction of lead operators on most rides. But let's move over to another one of their theme parks, where you'll find the Tower of Terror. Disney's Tower of Terror lives true to its name. The Tower of Terror at Disney World is an iconic and visually striking attraction known for its thrilling drops and immersive theme. The 1930s Hollywood styled ride takes you through a Twilight Zone themed story filled with suspense and the supernatural. Guests are led through a narrative involving the disappearance of hotel guests in an elevator during a lightning storm, setting the stage for the ride's main event. 
The elevator car itself serves as the ride vehicle, where guests experience a series of sudden, unpredictable drops. During the five minute ride, thrill seekers shoot up 13 stories in an elevator before plummeting back to the ground. These drops simulate free falling, a sensation that's heightened by special effects like the lightning flashes and all the ghost noises, setting a really entertaining scene. However, there were some cases where this Tower of Terror proved to go a bit beyond what people bargained for. Like on November 3rd, 2011, when a 12 year old boy from Argentina went to Disneyland Paris with his family. Excited about the Tower of Terror his friends had told him about, he was more than excited to jump on the ride. And at first, all went well. And when he got off the ride, he did feel a little bit sick, but his parents figured out it was just your typical nausea from the experience. However, his father was a doctor and started watching his son's condition get worse and worse. It got so bad that his father rushed his child to the infirmary. His condition continued to rapidly deteriorate and he was transferred to Paris's neck hospital for children. And by the time he reached the hospital, his upper limbs were paralyzed. He was then sent to the neurology unit as the paralysis spread to his lower limbs. But things only got worse as he suffered respiratory arrest before being rushed to intensive care. X-rays then revealed a spine and bone contusion. Now, as he'd been playing sports prior, Disney had grounds to oppose any responsibility. Dr. Seneca curiously declined to link or even suggest the injuries were a result of Disney's beloved ride. And the sad reality was that this child was now paralyzed for life. The same Tower of Terror ride was also built in Florida, and Leanne, who similarly was only 16 years old, rode the Tower of Terror back in 2005. The day was going well, and you can actually see this picture of the very ride that would ruin her life. Leanne had a massive smile on the ride, but it didn't last long. Feeling shaky and lightheaded when she exited the roller coaster, she was then also sent to paramedics, where her condition continued to deteriorate further. The thrill happened to be too much for her heart to handle, and it stopped as Leanne was being rushed to the hospital, but doctors managed to resuscitate her. However, she was left with some severe heart problems and suffered a brain hemorrhage resulting in some brain damage. She couldn't speak and needed 24 hour care as a result of the rides. And so a few years later, she would actually attempt to sue Disney for not providing enough warning about the risks. But the lawsuit was futile as the family dropped all charges. Disney didn't even apologize for how the ride destroyed her life as this would be an admission of guilt. In fact, a Disney spokesperson simply claimed that the ride was working properly when she rode it, which says a lot about how Disney handles these cases. But the truth of the matter is that Disney will try to cover as many injuries and death as possible. Joseph Masters, who was an 83-year-old veteran who had a history of heart problems in 2019, had his heart stop beating on the People Mover. And as Disney had their own medical team at the time, they were sent to keep him alive until off-site. This meant that they were able to resuscitate him until he was moved off the premises. And as soon as he was off the premises, Disney didn't have to worry about him. And 30 minutes later, he would be pronounced dead at a nearby hospital. The cover-up of a naturally deceased man was uncalled for, all for the sake of keeping their reputation unmarked by the death. In another incident, a heartbroken man named Alan J. Ferris went in search of his ex-girlfriend with a smuggled-in gun in hand. He took two security guards hostage for about 10 minutes, demanding to see his ex, who was a Disney employee. And after releasing the security guards, he actually asked the surrounding police to murder him. Failing that, he put the gun to his head and ended his life right there. But again, he did take his own life and was pronounced dead at the Orlando Regional Medical Center, not at Disney, where this had actually taken place. And so the true death count is uncertain because of these cover-ups and because of people being in the hospital at the time. But on record, it is 93 deaths on site in 90 separate instances. Whether they were a natural cause of death or death by their own machine malfunctions or death by accident, a very low percentage of 14% of the deaths were settled by Disney. It is important to note that just because Disney settled with the families of the deceased doesn't mean that they take on the blame or responsibility. Attempting to conceal the number of deaths on their premises is not the only dark side to Disney. There are other less obvious behind the scenes crimes that might surprise you that Disney are at the very least connected to. You'd expect Disney to understand the value of a kid's joy, especially considering it's what their entire business model falls on. But you don't have to look far back in the history to find out they were very happy to exploit kids in many different ways. One of which was using sweatshop with workers as young as seven years old. Disney, known for its magical theme parks and heartwarming movies, is also in the business of merchandise. Of course, this is one of their huge profit channels. All those t-shirts, toys, and other goodies that kids love. However, some of these products were being made in sweatshops, which might not sound surprising until you find out this was happening in the US, specifically in California. So what happened here? But it all started with some investigative work. 
Activists and labor rights groups began to unravel the truth behind the production of these Disney products, where they would discover factories with working conditions that were, to put it mildly, far from the magical world Disney is known for. We're talking about workers being paid way below the minimum wage, working in unsafe conditions, and facing what can only be described as exploitation. Because Disney was using a company called KTBA to create Disney products like tiaras and wands, inspired by characters like Tinkerbell, Ariel, and Sleeping Beauty. The tiaras, for example, were sold for $9.95 to $15.95, and the wands for $2.65. These were naturally pretty popular items, and KTBA had a high demand for them, and so to incentivize their workers to make as many as possible, they would pay workers per item instead of per hour, which meant workers would make about 60 cents for each tiara completed and 40 cents for the wands. To meet the state's minimum wage, they would need to make a tiara every six minutes. However, the actual pace that many of the workers could manage was about two tiaras per hour, resting in an hourly wage of around $1.35, way below the minimum wage at the time of $6.25 per hour. And the workers, while facing financial challenges, were also facing physical ones. In the rush to assemble these products, they would risk injuries from hot glue and wire. Many of the workers continued to work at home, which was illegal as they did not have proper permits, and so workers typically worked 48 hour weeks. But to make things even worse, the same factory was actually found to violate child labor laws, hiring at least 15 minors from age 7 to 15 years old. The workers helped assemble the products that Disney profited from. But as soon as the news came public, Disney dropped the company as its manufacturer and set up a fund of $902,000 to compensate the workers and decided to destroy the remaining stock of tiaras and wands. However, this wouldn't be the last time they used sweatshops because just a few years later, they'd be called out for using sweatshops in Bangladesh, China, and Haiti. They need to keep their product pricing down and to meet its high demand. According to Disney, they have no legal responsibility on what these companies do, essentially saying they don't care about child slave labor, which also begs the question on what other child abuse aspects they don't care about, despite the fact that children are their prime focus for making money. While these are all horrifying to hear of, something way more gruesome is at play. Disney theme parks have higher visitor rates of young children and young adults, so it's no surprise that this would also attract the attention of sex trafficking and child predators to the parks. Now you don't need to look far for these cases to make you feel sick. One particular Disney employee by the name of Robert Kingslover, a 49 year old, worked as a service manager who repaired rides at the Magic Kingdom Disney World. He starts an online chat with a 14 year old girl. The two would then speak for a while and he'd eventually make a plan to meet the young girl where they planned to have sex. Kingslover wrote, I work for Disney, so I love to see dads having fun with their daughters. I believe in treating a lady like a princess. I treat ladies with respect because this is how I hope my daughter gets treated. Once King's lover reached the house, what he found were detectives from Lake County, Florida. Despite being caught red-handed and a clear conversation record, King's lover still pled not guilty. However, he would be swiftly arrested after the sting operation set up to arrest various predators trying to meet with a minor for sex and soliciting a child for sexual acts. The police's evidence is also pretty damning. In the chat logs, King's lover says that he is snuggly and cuddly and enjoys giving oral. Keep in mind that he really thought he was talking to a child. He claimed he would never hurt a child and that his intentions was to call the authorities once he had met the 14 year old girl. He still stood his ground, saying that he intended to warn the girl's father and thought he was helping. However, this doesn't really hold water as he introduced the sexual implication of the conversation. And this is sadly just one of many cases of predators involved in and around Disney's theme parks. Just recently on September 28, 2023, three Disney employees were arrested for their involvement in a major Florida human trafficking and sex ring. That includes a security guard, custodian, and training coordinator. Go back another year and another four Disney employees were arrested in a massive undercover operation targeting human traffickers, child predators, and prostitutes. Institution. Between 2006 and 2014, there were 35 employees arrested for child sex abuse offenses. So you'd imagine that Disney would at least put procedures in place in the hiring process to have any previous violations reported. And Disney has confirmed that they do do background checks, but it seems they're not that thorough. However, after people started to investigate this, they found that Disney application forms don't mention any background searches, and given the amount of employees who are slipping through the cracks, it does seem quite unlikely that background checks are done. This has to be a park for children with a promise of a safe day for fun, 
This isn't to say that Disney isn't aware of any issues or completely turns a blind eye to it. They do have over 70,000 employees, making it impossible to avoid it. And there are people who have no background history that do get involved in this kind of horror. And there might not always be a way to tell this. But when it comes to sex trafficking in general, Disney seems less than excited to make statements against sex trafficking. Disney has two of their own lobbyists registered on the legislation, and both would not make a call on the new law proposed that would allow hotels to be sued for not having enough sex trafficking preventative methods. Disney's lobby neither testified for nor against it, and it seems that Disney are either in denial or choosing to ignore or avoid the harsh reality of sex trafficking. But when you take a deeper look at Disney's past, and child exploitation is in its very roots. The wonderful Walt Disney himself has had many accusations against him. After Walt Disney's death in 1966, some of those who worked closely with Walt would come forward with accusations and suggestions that he was perhaps a predator. That includes Jane Wyman, President Reagan's first wife, and Bobby Driscoll, a child star associated with Disney. However, it's very important to note that these are allegations and there is no concrete evidence or verified accounts from the time when Disney was alive to support these claims. But if we look at some of Walt Disney's books and the films that he wrote, it becomes pretty damning evidence. In Disney's classic tales, the characters are always shouting glitter, but the stories behind them are often gross in reality. In Sleeping Beauty, the princess is 16 years old, whilst Prince Philip is a full-grown adult. But perhaps the worst of them all is Snow White from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, where she is supposed to be 14 years old, and her prince is believed to be a 31-year-old. Or do you remember that scene from Pinocchio, where the guy mentions this dark island where all the naughty boys go? I'm collecting stupid little boys. Stupid little boys? You know, the disobedient ones, what play you give them school. Oh, and I take them to Pleasure Island. Ah, uh, Pleasure Island. Pleasure Island? But the law, suppose they... No, no, there's no risk. Is he resembling something like Epstein's Island? Yes, it's important to note that these ages are not officially confirmed by Disney, and are usually just based on popular belief and speculation. But it's easy to see why this is an issue. And whilst Disney has evolved recently and gradually increased their ages, this old stuff can't really be forgotten. It felt like they were dropping some truth bombs on the public for years, giving you an insight into the dark side of Hollywood and the elite circles in America. And it makes you wonder why Disney is willing to pull ads from X.com when they believe that Elon Musk is making anti-Semitic remarks, and yet they refuse to pull ads from Meta. According to a lawsuit against Disney, Facebook and Instagram steer children to explicit content. That is even when little to no interest is expressed by the user. The lawsuit also proves that Meta's companies are enabling child predators to find and contact minors. The investigations found that children are pressed by predators into providing photos of themselves or participating in very graphic videos. This lawsuit came at a similar time to when Bob Iger pulled advertising from X.com. Obviously, this is all smoke and mirrors, and is done for Disney's PR team to make sure the company looks politically correct. But there is a darker side to Disney in the movie industry that leans towards exploiting child actors. These actors are well known, and it's mainly due to Disney that they were even able to climb the ladder to fame. However, it seems it came at a cost. Keep in mind that these claims were only from famous child actors who have since spoken out. Those who maybe never made it up the ladder might have made the list a bit more extreme. When Disney hired Brian Peck, a famous actor, to work on Disney's The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, it's weird that nobody asked any questions about it. See, although Brian Peck has had a pretty successful career as an actor, working on films like The Willies, The Return of the Living Dead, and X-Men Prior, his past does have some skeletons that were taken out of the closet for the world to see in 2004. You see, he spent 16 months in prison after he pled guilty to oral copulation with a child, Ludax, and attempted sodomy with a minor. And this child was one he was working with in Nickelodeon at the time, being the acting coach for the child. Brian would then invite the unnamed child to his house for the coaching lessons, and would then commit these vile acts. Eventually, the child told his parents what had happened, and Brian was reported to the police and investigated. So he essentially used the movie industry role to abuse a Nickelodeon star, and the sad reality is that this wasn't taken seriously enough, and the industry actually looked past his disgusting acts if they thought that he could make them more money. And although a registered sex offender and known pedo that is prohibited from direct contact with children, still somehow made it through the hoops to work with and produce videos in which children are acting. But it's the type of person you'd expect Disney to take a look at 
and make the decision not to hire, given that he'd been working directly with many a set that compromises more children than adults. For Disney alone, he's worked on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody in 2007, which was barely a year after his release from prison, and Bedtime Stories in 2008. The decision to hire people like Brian with such criminal backgrounds raises serious concerns about the safety and well-being of child actors on set. It also points to a larger systemic issue within the entertainment industry, where the protection of vulnerable individuals often seems to be secondary to other interests. It's something we see happening more than once with Disney actors, particularly the child stars. Like most Disney actors, getting the part and becoming famous is the driving factor for most kids. This is the dream, the hope of everyone applying to be the next Disney star. However, for Demi Lovato, this dream soon turned into an absolute nightmare. You see, Demi has told the world about how she lost her virginity to rape in 2008. The culprit was no less a fellow on-screen actor. She doesn't disclose his identity, but says that while she did report the incident, he was not removed from set and had no consequences for his actions. And she was only 16 when this happened. She even partially blamed herself as they were in a sense romantically involved, but being as young as she was, insisted that they not cross that line. Demi had a promise ring not to indulge in such acts, and took it seriously. However, boundaries were crossed despite her objections and the damage was done. Demi even said in an interview, I was part of that Disney crowd that publicly said they were waiting until marriage. And yet, I didn't have the romantic first time. In fact, she had to appear as though nothing had happened on set, as she had to save face to protect the lie that she was even saving herself for marriage. She felt like a hypocrite, even though this was rape. As a Christian, Demi struggled with accepting what had happened, not revealing which movie she was working on at that time, but Camp Rock was one production she was working on in 2008. The production isn't revealed, as it would be presumed that every male co-star on set would then potentially be the rapist. When reporting the rape, nothing was done about it. Demi had to face her rapist daily on set and continue her facade and trauma. In an attempt to gain control a month after the rape, Demi addressed her attacker, but this only made her feel worse. Clearly, the experience traumatized her, and so she began to hide her trauma in other ways, which kickstarted an eating disorder. In later years, this developed into depression and thoughts of passing her own life. And finally, Demi gave in to taking drugs as a form of escape, something which was well documented throughout her career. I picked up a bottle of red wine that night, and it wasn't even 30 minutes before I called someone that I knew had drugs on them. In 2018, Demi was again sexually assaulted by her dealer at the time and left for dead after an overdose. This resulted in her suffering a heart attack and brain damage. But this rock bottom was her turning point as she began to deal with her past and was very determined to stay sober. However, this isn't the only way Demi felt let down by Disney. The star of Camp Rock claimed to have been barricaded in her hotel room as a form for Disney to keep control on her eating disorder. Demi said that she was not allowed access to her phone to stop her from ordering room service. The snack bar in her room was removed. The hotel security guard was aware of it and did nothing to help her. Demi also said that after she vomited blood as a result of her eating disorder, she asked to get medical attention, and the staff told her she was not sick enough to not work. If this was not bad enough, her income from Disney productions were the only source of income for her entire family. And as young as she was, she was the sole breadwinner, with her father working as her manager, dependent on her income to afford to pay his salary. Demi also hoped that her speaking about her past and encouraged Disney to relook at how they handle these kinds of problems. She felt that as a big company, it was their responsibility to have taken the rape more seriously as the repercussions in her life have been devastating. Demi revealed this in a documentary video called Dancing with the Devil, but she wasn't the only one. Another Disney star, Jordan Perit, suffered a more severe case of sexual abuse of her former manager, Keith Thomas. Jordan was only 14 at the time. Her hopes and dreams came crashing down on what can only be described as any child horror experience. She revealed her story in a Facebook post in December 2018, where she revealed that she had been a victim of sexual abuse. At the time, she didn't reveal who the abuser actually was, but it was later that she sued those who were ultimately responsible for her safety and those who had failed her, holding Hollywood and particularly Disney responsible for failing to protect her against her abuser. Part of her lawsuit's argument was, quote, full knowledge, consent, and assistance of Disney and Hollywood records to exploit these relationships in order to gain access to Plantif and to set up facilities and arranged meetings and encounters between he and the minor Plantif, for the purpose of Keith Thomas engaging in childhood sexual abuse of Plantif. In short, Jordan holds Disney and Hollywood Records responsible for allowing the meetings to take place while she was unaccompanied, leaving her alone with this toxic manager. She claimed it was their responsibility to ensure stars are protected, especially childhood stars, and if not done, they should share some of the blame here. But Jordan said that Disney and large companies such as these are far more focused on sales, money, and charts 
rather than the protection of minors in their industry. The list of horrific sexual acts that happened to her are something no 14 year old should ever have to endure. It includes quote, rubbing, petting, fodling plaintiff sexually on her genitals and body, digitally penetrating plaintiff, giving deep passionate kisses where he tongue kissed her mouth and body, forced to already copulate him, rubbed his clothed and unclothed body, and rubbed his penis on her vagina, taking her virginity, and suspecting that on one occasion, she was actually drugged and anally penetrated. This sadly was followed by threats from Keith Thomas in an attempt to keep Jordan quiet. She was told that it was their secret and that if she told anyone, it would result in her being taken away from her parents, and that her entire movie career would end, and ultimately she would end up in jail. He brainwashed her into believing him and made her promise to never tell anyone. The abuse then escalated when Keith would delete her male contacts on her phone, justifying it that they were soulmates. Keith was, however, engaged to be married to a lady of his own age. This abuse would continue until just before her 16th birthday. You can only imagine the amount of trauma this caused her. It's too horrific to even look at, and it was Jordan's hope that this lawsuit against them would force Disney to focus to protect the minors that they employ. But why would they when the only consequences seem to be a mere slap on the wrist, as she's just one of many, many victims in the history of Disney?